Look at these individual throttle bodies of glory. Oh yes, oh I'm a professional. Oh God. So you turn this map all the way down to one, you turn this map down all the way to one, traction control is in fact off. So here's the brake lights, I can see that illuminating. So here's an example of one of the brake rotors on the Daytona prototype, and I'm mostly just impressed that I said all that without screwing it up. Uh, amazing memories, and I think we're gonna make some mem <laughs> What's up, people? Today we are back with the Riley Mark 22 Daytona prototype that is powered by the Dynan built BMW V10 engine. And I'm mostly just impressed that I said all that without screwing it up. But now I'm saying I'm not screwing it up, which is screwing it up. So today we're going to go over it and check it out because the first video last week, you guys basically, we just did the unveil, showed it to you. I have one of my past students from Genius Garage, Austin Wright here. He was actually on the very first year team. So it was neat to catch up with him and just see, hear his opinion, looking back upon Genius Garage and seeing its growth now that he's actually out there in the industry as an engineer. So anyway, guys, here it is. Come take a little closer look. So right now as it sits, I'm just going to kind of just go over it as I see. So carbon fiber bodywork here. We've got a couple of fiberglass spares up front. Uh, the carbon will be a little, little bit stronger. Um, it can be lighter, of course, but the reason it's lighter is because it's stronger, so therefore you can use less material and then have less weight. But generally speaking, fiberglass can do really well. I think this particular is all carbon, and then the spare nose is actually fiberglass, spare nose and tail. But um, the front on here is actually painted. This car had a bit of a shunt where it took off the nose and a bit of the tail, but didn't hurt the frame and stuff like that. So it's obviously a race car been well loved, well used, and then re replaced and fixed and whatnot. Also, I see there's a wrap on it, and originally at one point, it looks like it was painted orange under here. That's pretty typical. So we'll probably keep it black for now with regard to Genius Garage, maybe put some of our decals on it, but in the future, do some sort of really cool wrap. And since this is a very techy, more modern race car, uh, it might be fun to get a little wild. So I thought I'd show you guys a few things. It's kind of neat. You see, obviously, the aerodynamic dive planes. Uh, typically in the streetcar world, you guys see these kind of things and they're not really that functional a streetcar, but when you get into racing stuff like this, it really makes a big difference for balancing your aerodynamics. Also, if you look here, um, there's a little bit of a kind of a gurney fence or a lip here in front of this area and that's as the air flows here to help create more of a low pressure here. And what the uh, vents do is when you got that airstream boom, going right under here, it hits the tire, has nowhere to go, some of it has to come up. So you have vents here to relieve um, lift so that all helps for downforce. And poor camera guy, he's way in the back. Come over here, camera guy. Let's look at the front of the car first. He's doing such a good job. <laughs> all right. Uh, you got your scoop here. We've got three inlets right here for the cockpit and things going on. Um, you can see on the side windows, on both sides, you can look over there, there's a little round um, polycarbonate, I don't even know what the heck you call them, a vent, which is typical for aviation. And this vent is something that the driver can pop out um, and it can be a scoop. If you want to look at it on the outside here, it'll be a scoop. Or you can turn it around and pop it out and it'll be a vent to let air out. So that's, that's kind of how that works in terms of the outside. Also, you notice because this was a track day car, if you want to look at the wheel right here, these are in fact three-piece BBS, very nice. They were milled with a ball mill here on the inside to make them really light, but it's got a five bolt hole pattern, typically for a street car. Because it was a track day car, it makes it a little easier um, rather than a car that's gonna do the, the 24 hours of Daytona. Obviously some amazing, looks like, are they six piston? Six piston calipers here. You got your typical big uh, steel rotors that are slotted and vented. Um, and then on a center hat here with buttons, typical for the racing world, really cool in that regard. Uh, obviously, you'll notice as well, um, so we've got this scoop for air going into the cockpit, and you've got these two big ones down here for the brakes. That's what cools the front brakes. And then uh, your headlight covers here, these are actually polycarbonate clear, but it appears that they were wrapped on the inside silver um, because they were mostly just running in the day and they didn't put the lights in. We actually have the lights over here in the spares. We'll check those out. Um, really nice mirrors here on uh, aero tubing, probably chromoly. Um, very nice carbon piece. So these are just shows the quality of it. This car does have a windshield wiper. It's not installed right now, but it's right here's where it drives. And obviously you can see the nature of all the carbon dash and the extra support. So you got a lot of, a lot of safety in here with the roll cage, which we're going to see. Now, if you want to look at the side of the car over here, you can start looking at the nature of the way the air is channeled, which I think is kind of neat. Uh, so this uh, sort of dog bone shaped inlet, uh, this goes specifically for the radiators. There's two of them, one mounted on either side, uh, which is nice because it's a mid-engine car. 
um, and much like Indy cars and Formula One have been for the, a good number of decades, shall we say, you've got your radiators back here. So the air can come in through the side and then channel out the back where you'll end up having a lower pressure underneath the car through vents as well as there. Now the other thing it does is the weight of the water and the tubing and such is closer to the motor. So you have less complication than trying to take that all the way to the front of a car. If you have say like a 4 GT40 or a Lola T70 or something from the 60s or 70s where you'd have your radiator in the front and your engine, mid engine in the back. So you don't have all those tubes, it condenses it. It also does something nice for the engineering of it because when you keep your mass or your, the weight, all the things that weigh something more on the inside of the wheelbase and track of the car, it just works better for the dynamics of being able to change direction quickly. So good for racing dynamics. You can also see, maybe uh, look at the front here again, and forgive me, Aaron's doing the camera guy, he's doing a good job, but he doesn't know where I'm thinking. And I don't know where I'm thinking either, we're just looking at the car. But if you think as the air flows over, it's got kind of this weird nose, which I don't think is actually the prettiest thing in the world, but it, it actually does a very important function. So you got your big splitter here, and there's metal uh, underneath it, and you have some air flowing underneath that you can channel, depending on how you're gonna, if you do an under tray or whatnot, to create downforce by basically creating a low pressure under the car. But the rest of the air is gonna come this way and you got you know this amounts going to your brakes. But as it flows in here, it's kind of creating a, a pressure. This is sort of diving it down, but this fence channels the air and it's gonna speed up as it comes through this channel. And that helps uh, maybe, or not maybe, but that helps keep it basically stuck to this cockpit, the side of it and channeling it right here to the radiator. So it's interesting how the air first contacts the car and gets directed has everything to do with how it's being channeled to the radiator and then channeled all the way out the car and through the back. So when you're thinking of race cars and aerodynamics, uh, it's not just let's stick this here, let's stick that there. You have to think about uh, the entire car as a whole and what all you have to accomplish by managing the airflow in and around a uh, vehicle. So that's kind of neat to look at it in that regard. And obviously you have a certain amount of airflow coming on the side and then this starts to come inward this, creating a little bit more of a lower pressure as it comes back and, and directing it down there. Uh, pretty much a flat side. You'll notice down the side of it, there's a real interesting, this is like a flexible plastic skirt here. Not too much different than what was on ground effect Formula One cars in the late 1970s and create more of a channel. And that of course can rub and whatnot. We could maybe make a different one out of polycarbonate, maybe even get crazy and put like a little flexible skirt on it. Um, to really direct the air underneath. Um, and I don't know if that's something that the sportsmen did or that came with it, but it should be a lot of fun for Genius Garage students to mess with the aerodynamics. We come to the back of it, and I'm gonna, these are two um, of the rear wing elements. These are very lightweight. Um, I don't wanna drop them because they're very, very nice quality carbon. So this is um, you know replacement for the top level. And obviously you guys can see we have three sets of uh, wheels and tires here, which is actually more than we need. Um, but it's awesome to have. So let me set the, these just over here. And if you want to come over here and check it out. So we've got vents going on here to create a low pressure. You know, in an engine bay, you're going to create a lot of ambient heat. And you do want to have some airflow around the engine, around the headers, et cetera, to let that out. So, you know, you create a little bit of a low pressure here as the air is going to want to fall down and get some of the heat out, get some of the heat out this way. But lots of your air is going to end up from the engine bay as well, the radiator and such. It's gonna be flowing out here, uh, out these vents. And then um, there's no under tray, no venturi. So you are gonna create a bit of low pressure back here and it's gonna be coming out uh, in that regard. It's kind of interesting the way it's sculpted. You can see it really flows and there's a bit of a, a lip up here. Um, maybe like a subtle cam effect. Uh, and then obviously you've got a massive wing right here. And if you wanna look, stand right here, Aaron, and look at it. If you look at this top surface of wing, this actually slopes upward here, which is counterintuitive. You think it always wants to point down. But if you draw a line from the leading edge here to the trailing edge, you're, I'm gonna say that's probably about five degrees, five, 10 degrees pointing downward. And then of course, this is creating your airfoil surface and then with your second layer. So this is a very high downforce wing, uh, which is interesting to see. And currently this top part here, not only does it have the little gurney flap or wicker on it to give you more downforce there, but it's also in its extreme downforce position. So by loosening this Allen bolt and the nut on the other side, as well as over there, and then the clampy guys here, look at these clampy boys. Um, you can slide this downward and you can adjust the downforce of the rear of the car. Now, the last couple of things I'll make note of with regard to the aerodynamics you wanna check, there's a scoop right here. And that, and you can see right there the K&N air filter. So that is actually for the engine's intake. 
which is interesting because I wonder if it's raining um, and you're bringing a certain amount of water, if there's any kind of trap or anything for that. Also, there's a hole right here, which is kind of an interesting place. Uh, you can see that's an aluminum fair welded and such. So we got a hole here and a hole here. Those direct to the rear brakes. And then this little guy here, I'm not quite sure where this directs, but I think it's, it's probably going somewhere important. I know it sounds stupid, but I can't remember. So clearly if they design this to be down here, which is not, it's not a scoop. Okay. And it's not on a leading edge of the, the car. This must be a high pressure zone. Um, and then of course, being a high pressure zone, air is going to want to flow into these holes. Uh, and those direct to the uprights or where the wheels are mounted and then to the center area of your moving brake rotor. Because if you guys think about what a brake rotor is, it's round, it has the fins on the inside, and as it spins, it works just like a water pump. So in this circumstance, a brake rotor doesn't care if it's spinning in water or air, it's still gonna create the same effect of drawing it through the middle and going out the outside. So having a higher pressure here, where air is gonna wanna flow from cool ambient air to the brakes, that's how that works. So kinda neat to see, also if you look in the back, there's rain lights, brake lights, and believe it or not, turn signals. Here's your rain light in the center, just as you see on formula cars and the like. Um, and then you got your LED guys here for brakes, but believe it or not, this thing actually has turn signals. I'm not really entirely sure why, maybe it's just to indicate pit in. And then this guy here at the end, this is for very high pressure air or nitrogen. And this is for your air jacks. So this will be attached to a hose. And let's see, do we have, where's our cart? Oh, it's over there. Our cart's over there, but you know, a nitrogen bottle looks no different than a welding bottle. You just have to have a real high pressure line because you might crank that thing to three or 400 PSI, depending on how heavy your car is and effective the jacks are. So this got four jacks underneath it, and then you'd have the hose attached to it, and then to jack the car, you just come right over here, stick that on, whoosh, up it goes. Another interesting thing, and I gotta remember where it is, let's walk over here while we're talking about, come on, come on, Aaron, yes. So in here are a load of spares specifically for this car. You can see we've got extra drive shafts or half shafts, but actually these little guys here are, are an interesting thing. So when you hit those air jacks and they go whoosh, come down, raise the car up, you'll take this, slide it on, put them all in place, and then you'll let the air out gently because this will mechanically lock in place and even if the air pressure bleeds off, the car will sit on these stands so you can work on it. So this is a really nice piece here for servicing the car. And obviously you can see we're fortunate to have a lot of nice spares here, different exhausts. There's, there's hubs here. As you can see, we've got half shafts. We've got, we got brake rotor hats here. Uh, we've got different radiators. We've got fans. We've got the brake rotors. And I'm going to show you a brake rotor since we were talking about it. So it's really nice to have these extra things. And oftentimes race cars don't have fans because you, you warm it up on a time frame, you know when you're going on the track for qualifying or practice or racing, and you're on the false grid and they give you a time countdown and you just start it up so it you know, heats up the, the amount you want. And you just plan it that way. But on a car like that where it was done a track day, it's kind of nice to have the fans if you're able to have a strong enough electrical system, just in case you need it, you know, coming on or coming off. So here's an example of one of the brake rotors on the Daytona prototype. And you can see inside here, uh, obviously you have the fins and then you have all of the slots. Now these fins are not just straight up and down, they are curved like this. So this is where it bolts to the brake hat, which is a high strength aluminum alloy here in the middle to keep it lighter weight. And then of course your six piston calipers grab this rotor here. And as it spins, these fins on the inside are creating that effect to draw air from the center and bring it out through here. So it's basically working like a, a kind of a, a water pump in the air to continuously get a flow of air, cooling it on the ins from the inside out. Um, and then, of course, there's a heck of a lot more surface area with all these things on the inside to cool it down than on the outside. And the reason for all these little slots is as the brake pads hit it, it's creating uh, gas, high pressure gas. And these little slots give the gas somewhere to escape. So that also helps increase your braking effectivity. So let's go check out the car some more, set this down. It's really nice to get all the special oil and such. And as you know, they're running 1060 in it, um, a full synthetic because it's got that BMW M6 V10, which if you guys know from the street cars, they're very prone to, I believe, rod bearing failure because the nature of the clearances are tight. So you got one of those BMW M6s and you think it's a good idea to start it up cold and rev it because you think that's really impressive. Um, only to idiots because you're destroying your rod bearings. So let the car warm up, and I don't just mean the water temperature, let it warm up beyond that so the oil temperature comes up and the heat soaks so you actually get oil flow. Just throwing that out there so you don't wreck your Beamer. You're welcome. 
So let's take a look in the cockpit and last we're gonna boom, we're gonna get to the engine bay. So here's a, one of the doors. This is a beautiful carbon fiber door and I'll give you an example. Look, this is very lightweight. You know, you got the polycarbonate side glass and all and you can see Aaron, if you wanna take a look at all this carbon, it's very nice. And as an example, this carbon here has got texture to it and some of it else is smooth depending on how it came out of the mold. Obviously this is a race car. This isn't, you know, a million dollar Ferrari sitting in a showroom that they're trying to woo somebody with. So there's no sense in trying to make it too perfect. It's to do a job, it's to be very nice, but you know, they're not wasting tons of time to make it fit and finish like it's a, uh, a bejeweled new piece of jewelry from Fifth Avenue or something like that. But obviously you see the rest of the bare carbon here because if you paint or wrap carbon, that just makes it heavier. It's even got weather stripping right here for the door, which is actually really neat. Um, just goes to show the quality level and engineering of this Riley. You can see the very serious side impact tubes, um, you know, two bars vertical and then coming down into the chassis here. And if you want to look, I might get a light here. Uh, Blaine, do you have a light handy? Oh, you're using. Do you have another one handy no, you're not using? No, he's fine. Are you sure he's fine? Yeah, he's fine. Okay. Do we have, this one's kind of super pointy. Do we have one that like spreads out more? Where's that yellow one? We're ruining the video because I'm not prepared. Why would I prepare? This is real life. Thanks, dude. Okay, so take a peek. Aaron, you can kind of get down here and check it out too. So, come over here so you can see, you don't have to get in too much. So guys, if we look at the interior here, obviously you can see the dash. Um, predominantly you see all the toggle switches here because it's very easy to see if, is it on, is it off? So even though toggle switches can go way back when, you see that it looks like it's a World War II fighter plane or something. Um, it's even got water uh, sealant, looks like a, uh, an orange silicone in here to keep water out of it. These are very effective in racing because if you flip the switch, you can see if it's up or down. And typically in this circumstance, with things that are on or off, down is off, up is on. We'll go over that in a minute. You can also see that all of your master cylinders have a remote reservoir, which is right here, the Tilton, uh, for your, your front brakes, your rear brakes, as well your clutch. Uh, and that's a typical for a system that has a bias bar with two master cylinders. And the Let's see, the brake bias adjustment, I believe, is over on the left because I can't see it over here. But if we look down here right now, this car, you could actually put a passenger seat in. There's room. In fact, you can see the tube right here that was to, you know, to mount the secondary seat. And it's got these nice bosses. And you can also do so in the rear. And it also has places to mount the seat belts for a passenger, which is cool. However, this one, you've got your Motec system here. You've got your ignition expander because this is not a V8 engine. This is a V10 engine. So you have to have this to run the extra ignition systems. This is also part of the ignition. Right down here, and you're going to have to look up and look down here. This is for your tires, and this is going to tell you your tire pressure and temperatures on the fly. And if you look over here on the dash, you can see the gauge specifically for your tire pressure management system and all some buttons that relate to that. But coming back here, you got your Motorola uh, system for your radio to talk, and you've also got a double fire system here, which uh, is really fascinating. There's two bottles. I'm not entirely sure why there are two. Um, I'm thinking one of them may be manual that you, the driver can pull. If there's a fire in the cockpit or the engine bay, you pull that and it immediately releases all the contents throughout the whole car. However, there's two. So it's possible one of them could be wired up, um, to automatically go. So if a fire busts out inside there, it might just go off, um, or it just might be extra. I don't know. And then lastly, right over here, if you look, this was a real state of the art uh, about 10 years ago in terms of being your camera system and your data act to show. And if you want to back up a little, you can actually see one of the permanently mounted cameras up here off this roll cage. So you can really see your driving and all. You also notice right up here, that's a nozzle. This blue nozzle here is for the fire system and the high pressure system there. Uh, and I don't know if we can see other ones here. I'm just looking around. But if we look at the roof, you can see the bare carbon fiber of the roof here. You can also see the awesome roll structure that goes all the way around with this high, um, you know, highly dense padding uh, for helmeted heads and such. And then, then this net here to keep your body parts and things in place. And there's two releases. You can grab this and yank it, or you can pull this and it should just pop off. Let's see. Oh yeah, <laughs> it just comes off air like that. And there's one for the other side as well. But if you look across the way, you can see the inside, the beautiful carbon, bare carbon of the door, the door handle. Obviously you see a little vent up there on the window and a just a normal nylon pole strap for the door, very lightweight. And of course you see the side impact bar. So what I'm gonna do guys is I'm gonna go over there and jump in actually and uh, show you guys all the functionality. 
Okay, so let's go inside, yes. Also, you guys may enjoy this because it's frankly a very awkward car to get in and out of. In fact, Aaron, do you wanna come around here and watch this, this show, this horror show of me trying to get in the car and look cool? I am removing my cell phone and wallet. Come on over here. <laughs> you gotta see how it is to get in one of these things. In fact, I'm gonna remove everything I can from my pockets with the exception of the mic. Okay. Here we go. So I've heard there's two ways to get in. One, you just stick your butt in and slide around. I haven't tried that. Or you put your foot in, which will probably be more awkward and is the normal way I do it. So I'm just gonna do my normal way, which will be more awkward. Yes, here I go. And the door will be no help. And if I put all my weight on this, I might crack it because it's super lightweight. Oh yeah, this is graceful. Yes, wait, I'm breaking my leg. Here we go. Oh yes, oh, I'm a professional. Oh God. Ugh. <laughs> what? Wheel. What? What wheel? Steering wheel? Oh, the steering wheel? Oh yeah, that comes off. I don't know if that would actually would have helped me or not. Yes, look at that. Actually, that's kind of cool. There's a seatbelt on my butt. There's a seatbelt on my butt. Why is that? Why is that up my butt? Wait, I don't remember being like that. Oh, that's weird. Oh, that's a weird seatbelt. Okay. Yeah, I'm a hot mess. Okay, so anyway, I'm gonna stick this back on. Here's the quick release of the steering wheel, but let's look at that quick. So this car does in fact have paddle shifters. Um, and I dog on paddle shifters for street cars because Ferrari and Lamborghini totally sold out, got rid of all stick shifts so they could sell it to more rich people and make them think they're cool, even though they're not and they can't drive. But in a race car, it's actually helpful to go faster because you're not gonna mess up and it can shift faster with the dog box and stuff. So. What's interesting, the very simple actuation, this nice billet aluminum piece with a tiny little carbon fiber tab, and you feel that nice clickety clickety bang bang, has a rare earth element magnet right here and right there. So there's no springs in it. When I release, the magnet just sucks it right back together. I'm breaking the magnet apart, going back together. It's kind of neat. And then right here, there's just a little micro switch. And if you can see that teeny tiny little button that I push, that's it. That's what tells the computer to actuate the pneumatic RAM to shift it into gear, as well as to tells the computer to initiate the uh, computer protocol so you can shift it with your foot flat to the floor. So, I don't know, let's see. Hey Blaine, would you be so kind as to figure out what I did with the flashlight and hand it to me? <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. Oh, you got it? Oh, Aaron's got it, Never mind. Aaron's got this, okay. You guys wanna see my feet? You're welcome to everybody with a foot fetish. Okay, so they're down here. You can see the, the pedals, this is pretty interesting. So right here, there's a big grip tape fence and there's this platform for your feet to rest on. Get them up in the air so you can actuate and right at the ball of your foot where you're gonna be the most efficient, you're pushing right on the pedals here. Now, you don't need to tow heel downshift in this, but you could. You know, I can, I can operate two pedals at once, and then here's the clutch. Now, with the paddle shifting and the computer controls, I only need to use the clutch for starting and stopping. Or if by some reason we were, I don't know, around the pits or something, going so slow in first gear that it was making the car lurch and whatnot, and I need to dab the clutch or get in it like that. So, what's beautiful about having paddle shifting like this and computer controlled, it allows me to have a car, and since it's a fast car, that means I can then left foot brake because if I don't have to start and stop it, this turns into a giant go-kart where it's throttle and that controls all the throttle bodies via a direct mechanical linkage. Uh, and then of course, I'm pushing hydraulic fluid with the brakes. And we talked earlier about the ability to bias the braking effectivity from either the front to the rear. And that has to do with the mechanical advantage of how the pedal actually pushes upon the master cylinders, which are hydraulic cylinders. And this knob right here says F, it says R. So if I wanna bias it to the rear, I will turn this clockwise. If I wanna bias the braking pressure to the front, I will turn it counterclockwise. And you can do that while you're driving the car. Uh, you need to not be braking at the time, otherwise it'll be bound up. So if I find that I'm locking the front brakes way too early, then I might crank it to the rear a little bit. Or if I find under braking, it's getting tail happy and maybe I need to bring it to the front. So when someone's driving, you know, you're out there racing or you're qualifying or whatever, you're going, it's like you're braking hard, boom, boom, you're finding out it's wrong. You're gonna reach up there without even looking at it and you're gonna turn a little bit and you're gonna feel it out as you go. 
But, you know, hopefully in testing you get it close, but as conditions change or maybe your tires are different, et cetera, or something funky is going on with the car, you might have, to, might have to change it. So that's kind of a neat aspect there, just what you can do. So you're, you're using your left foot to use the clutch when you're starting and stopping, and then when you're out on the track, you can simply left foot brake and then throttle with your right foot. Now, if you also notice the way they're lined up, my legs for left foot braking get to be dead straight ahead. So the ergonomics are really perfect in that regard. There's also these big walls for your legs. So I guess if you crash, your legs are flopping all around. It keeps them kind of contained. And you'll also notice the net that we showed on the other side is right here. And it plugs into this uh, beautiful billet of aluminum quick release here. So if I needed to release this to get out of the car, I just yank this and it comes out. Or um, if you want something else to yank, you can just yank this and the net pops loose right there like that. So that's maybe even a quicker way to get out if you need to. But you can just start grabbing things that are red and it's gonna get you out of there. Other interesting things to look at here, guys. So you see these beautiful uh, bill aluminum fare. It says soft front, hard, hard rear soft. So basically this is the front sway bar or sway fin assembly and this is the rear sway bar sway fin assembly. So front, rear, okay? So if you want the car to be say softer in its swaying, okay, then, um, but you find it's, neutral let me think how to best des describe the relationship so let me put it this way the stiffer your front anti-roll sway bar is in relation to your rear the more you're going to understeer or induce more of an understeering effect the softer your front sway bar or fin is in relation to your rear being stiffer uh, you're going to induce more of an oversteer in a mid-corner mechanical grip scenario, uh, which can be masked by aerodynamic grip so in this circumstance let's say I want to make the whole car harder um, let's say it's adjusted here and you're driving it right in the middle, right? And let's say it's understeering a little bit in the mechanical grip, slower speed corners, and it's not all walked up by arrow. So let's say it's understeering a little bit and I want to make the car softer. So I would simply soften up the front. Maybe I'd start here and just soften up the front sway fin a little bit. And that's going to make it plow less because now this the front wheels can work their magic a little more free and grip better while making the car softer. Maybe I want to make the car stiffer, uh, but I want to achieve the same effect um, by making it uh, oversteer, by making it stiffer. Um, so I can do that with the rear by making the rear stiffer or harder. It's going to achieve the same effect. The car is going to get stiffer, but as it rolls, it's the rear is not going to want to grab quite as much more in relation the front can move. So that's sort of how that works. Um, it's exactly how that works actually, but I just want to show you guys that. So it's interesting. So before you go out and race, not only do you need to be fully aware of every single button and every single control, a lot of those are similar for all race cars, you need to embed in your mind exactly where these are so you don't have to look at them and you know exactly which one you're adjusting how before you do it. Because if you're absolutely right in the middle of everything going on and you need to do something like that, you need to be able to reach down and do it as fast or faster than that. So just an interesting thing. But if we look here on the um, steering wheel and the dash, so I'll go ahead and plug this in. Here's the big double redundancy main switch. I'm literally going to plug in the battery. Oh, look, our flashlight died. What a bummer. Okay, we're putting the air quotes on Genius and Genius Scratch today. Anyway, I'm going to plug this in for the battery. Well, maybe, maybe I am. <laughs> it's a lot easier if you have a guy. Oh, man. Whew. Okay, so the battery's plugged in. So, what do we got here? Let's go uh, master. And then we probably got to go data for the dashboard. Will it turn on? Boom, there's a dash. Oh, it's making ding dong noises at me. Boom. Okay, so it's showing me a few things here. Um, and frankly, I haven't gone over this yet, but you've got your tachometer here, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, 6,000. That's kind of weird, that seems wrong. The engine revs higher than that. Maybe it changes after it's on or something. Um, I haven't gone over this car yet. So this will tell you what gear you're in neutral. Um, and then if you want to cycle, let's see, how do you cycle this thing? Page, page button, I bet that doesn't. Yep, here we go. Okay, so I'm gonna guess oil pressure, this is oil pressure, OP, FP, fuel pressure, okay. Let's see what else we got. RPM, boom, there's this. That'll tell you the number, and then you should have a sweep for the RPM as well. Although I find it strange it only goes to six, that may change. Let's see, fuel, this may be the fuel level right here. And then, uh, let's see, that might be front right, rear right? Hold on, let me figure it out. Bias, that's interesting. This could be braking bias, I didn't know that would tell you. 
WS, WS. What do you think WS stands for? What? What do you think WS stands for? W5. Could be wheel speed. That could be, what do you think GR and GP stands for? GRGP? Yeah. Wow, that's got a lot of displays. Okay, we're gonna have to learn that. So, uh, you guys may have realized, we just got this car, and <laughs> we weren't expecting to, so we haven't gone over it entirely yet. So we're doing it together. So you got both paddles here. The right one's always upshift, the left one's always downshift. Um, there is a neutral button here. I assume that if you come into the pits, and it's in gear, like first gear, you, you, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna do neutral. If you're in a Ferrari street car, typically the way that you get into neutral is by pulling both paddles at the same time. In this circumstance, I have a feeling this red neutral button is, that's how you select neutral, so you can let the clutch out and can sit there and warm up or whatnot. Um, there are two buttons here. We've got a pit button, so you can maintain a pit speed, I'm, I'm assuming, for your, um, your rev limiter, and I don't know if that's an on-off sort of fare or you have to hold it, we'll find out. This is a radio button, clearly, so you can talk on the radio to your crew chief or whatnot. We've got an alarm button here that I frankly don't know what that's for, but I have a feeling that's to clear an alarm. So if it tells you that your water temperature is getting too hot, or your oil pressure is a little low, but everything's fine, you change it, maybe you push that and it clears it. I don't know, but we're gonna find out. Flasher button here. I'm thinking this is the button so you can flash your lights for if you're trying to pass somebody, like say you're at Daytona at night. Flashity flash, bang, bang, bang. Also, we have some, uh, this is the page button to go through your displays. And then we have a map control button here. So this is your opportunity to dial quickly some different maps or mapping on your computer. That could be anything from traction control to fuel maps, et cetera, and what your range is. As an example, here, we have a big traction control map channel here. So if I crank this all the way to 12, that's maximum traction control. Now, the guys whom we bought this from, they had the traction control dialed way down to like two or one, because when you get good or you, you don't need it much, and they're saying if you have it cranked up too far, it's just slowing down the car. But if you're in rain or really slippery conditions, something like that, um, yeah, I know we all wanna be awesome and we're all great because we all have egos and we all think we're Ayrton Senna or magic Jesus of racing, but we're not. And let's face it, if we have to think less, it makes life easier, especially if you're in the car for a long time. So if you know that it's really slippery and you're still slipping a little bit in rain or greasy conditions, maybe you wanna dial up the traction control a little bit easier. And it, it keeps the driver fatigue down over time. So this is an opportunity to dial that. If you wanna turn it completely off, uh, and no, you do not do burnouts and donuts in a car like this. It's not designed for it. It's not that it can't, but it's a race car. It's designed to go around a road race track, and it's so sophisticated that doing stuff like that can trash it. But the reason that people typically do it when they win like the Indy 500 or something, they have so much money, they don't give a rat's behind if they blow the engine or not. And the mechanic has to do it anyway. And generally speaking, nobody gets mad at you if you just won the Indy 500. But they might, I don't know. So you turn this map all the way down to one, you turn this map down all the way to one, traction control is in fact off uh, as the way it's programmed right now. If we come on over here, it's some other interesting things. We literally have an adjustment for the mirrors, left and right. Oh, and I can hear it moving. Aaron, you wanna, I'll adjust the mirrors. This is amazing, you guys, this thing has adjustable mirrors. That's amazing. All right, so I'll go left. Oh my gosh! I cannot believe that exists on a race car. It's amazing. That's amazing. Okay, come on back, Aaron. I'm not accustomed to this kind of luxury. <laughs> Okay, so um, you got your tire pressure management system here at Stack Age. It's really tiny. I guess the guys weren't using it too much. Like I said, you got your master switch for your electrical on. Data means your data here. Uh, we have a number of things. I believe fuel for the ECU bypass. I believe this is if you're gonna be pumping fuel out of it, I'm thinking. We'll have to find out. Also, here, that's for your fuel pump to be sucking from the main. And then if you get down to too low, you gotta switch it over to reserve, and then you got like one lap chill to get your butt back in the pits. There's your start button to turn it over. Um, and then obviously if you engage that, your ignition coils will be hot. Um, there is a switch here for rain. Let's find out, is that the rain light? Yeah, it is. Aaron, do you wanna go to the back and I'll show you guys the rain lights and brake lights and stuff? Okay, so I told you guys before, we have a number of different opportunities. So Aaron, so here's the brake lights. I can see that illuminating because I got a camera on right now. So those are brake lights. I'm gonna switch the rain light on right now. So I believe that's the one in the middle. That's, that's your rain light you turn on if it's, obviously if it's raining so people can see you. Uh, even we don't have your brake lights on. Now this is what's crazy. This car actually has turn signals. Look at that. Is that the right one's going off? And then there's the left one. 
Now I can't just cancel it because it cancels after a certain amount of time. But Aaron, if you want to come back up in here, I'll show you what's going on with regard to that. So actually, Aaron, you might be able to see better on this side. I don't know. It's your call, dude. All right, guys, so here's the switches. So this is your turn signal. So I switch it over there, it returns to the middle. That starts doing right. And you also see the flashing up here on this little MoTeC display that, and then left, boom, that's flashing to indicate turn signals. Now, I'm not actually certain right now if this is also giving you lights for shift lights. I'm guessing it is and can also do that. Here's the rain light that's on, but it doesn't indicate anywhere. And then you've got your highs and lows for your lights here. Um, this is the wiper. You can hear it actuating there real quick. That's high. And then you got a low speed. Yeah, and then that's that. And then you can turn it off. Um, your lights, don't die, camera person. You got high and low. I'm not going to turn it on because the lights aren't hooked up and I don't want something weird to happen if it shorts or something. So that's basically that. And I can go ahead and kill the master here and that kills everything, including the data. But I'm going to turn that back on for right now. I want to show you something else. So there's a couple of interesting things, guys. One, for if you're driving at night, this is obviously sort of that old like Indiglow digital watch kind of light up thing and the lights you can see. But how do you see your switches at night? Well, when I turn on the lights, something you'll notice happen, it starts to glow just a little red. And that's because if you look at my hands, see the red light? There's a little LED red projection thing here that just projects, projects a red light upon the switches. Um, it'd be illuminated really well, but red light is best for night inside the cockpit of a race car or an airplane, map reading, etc. so it doesn't screw up your night vision completely. So that's something else neat, but a neat little red light built right in there like that. And then lastly, you'll see right here, I've got a camera monitor for my rear view. There's a little camera back there, um, and it gives me an okay field of vision. Uh, but then I have the mirrors for behind and also out to the side of the blind spot because as you'll notice There are no windows on this car right here to be able to look through in the back So that's kind of that last little thing I'll mention to you guys is this is where you plug in to connect Oh my gosh our wires are messed up Durr. Okay, here we go. I'm not stupid. I swear Okay so you plug right in there so you can connect to your ECU for mapping, programming, etc. And then you got a USB connection for your computer. That's how you change things like that. If you just want to get to data that's stored potentially elsewhere in the dash, then you've got this connection right here, which is a little mil spec connector that turns like that. So you click that baby on there. I'm making sure I'm doing this right. Watch me screw it up on camera. Like Antiques Roadshow or something. Yeah. Okay. So there's that. <laughs> And this has got this line, so it might be nice to have an adapter to connect it to USB or something. But this is so you can get your data acquisition relating to the driver or what's going on with the car. And then lastly, there's a big plug in here for an auxiliary battery. So if you need an auxiliary battery, just so you don't drain the car battery for if you're starting it or doing things in the pits, uh, programming it or doing ECU stuff, here's your plug in. And then it's got this big red insulator on it so it doesn't accidentally somehow connect when it's in the car so there's your aux okay so this is the big master cutoff it's sort of your your fail safe thing to just totally cut power from the battery to everything right now um, even with this being all technological and cool um, there's still things that matter in the real world because let's face it, see all the electronic things here? I don't trust them. They fail. If this thing's fail, I cannot see that it's failed and it can skits out in a, in a myriad of different ways. But this switch is either going to work or it's not. And if it's up, I know it's supposed to be one way. And if it's down, I know it's supposed to be another way. So there's a lot to be said for something you can see and instantaneously know what's going on uh, with the mechanics of cars. So that's why you see things like major just physical breaks of the electrical. That's why you see those kinds of things because it's still important with the redundancy of safety. So let's do this, you guys. I'm going to set this up here, hopefully like an intelligent human being. Oh, yes, that works. All right. Okay, watch me get out of this. Like some sort of magical gazelle. You want to watch this? This is going to be stupid. I don't know if this is the good way to get out or not. Derp, derp. No, nope, this is probably a dumb way to get out. Oh, I'm out. Oh, that was graceful. Yes. It wasn't that bad. Okay. I'm going to put the steering wheel back on as a good driver should. Plus, I don't really want to let it sit around where it can fall because if it falls down inside there, it could easily break off a switch or a dial. And not only can those be expenses, you don't want to have to replace them at the wrong time. 
Um, hey, would you guys over there be so kind as to help me get the engine cover off so I can show people the engine and stuff? Yeah. All right. Aaron, you know, we still got audio and everything working good? Yep. Cool. No, we'll just do it in real time. So guys, I'm going to show you this here. This, these, these, come here. So this, this latch is really neat. It's, if you just grab it and yank it, you'll probably break something. There's a little safety button. Look down. There's a little safety button right here that you push over and then you can pull it up to release it. And then it's still not totally released. Then you have to grab this and bring it up and over because this is what grabs it. And that squishes all together and aligns it right there and just locks it with the redundancy of it. So we've got a bunch of cl clips here. And these are very strong um, and they're bolted through and sandwiching the carbon of the uh, deck and all. And so we've got four of them in the rear that hold the engine cover on. We've got two in the front up high and then two on the bottom in the front here. Now, what was the protocol? We lifting the front slightly? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then let's go over top the front of the car. And if you guys want to look on the inside of this, you can see the bare carbon. It's quite light. Obviously, I'm holding this up with like literally two fingers in my hand. Um, so, okay, let's sit over here, Blaine. I think there's room. Maybe we can set it down on its nose. Yeah. I think it's got it. Boom. All right, I'll go to that side. Aaron, you stay there. Okay, guys, so engine, cover, the whole bay, half the car is apart. So why don't you go back just a little bit and I'll kind of give you the vibe. Maybe stand over here so you can see in. So one thing that's interesting about this particular Riley uh, it was built so the tubular space frame of it, um, the suspension is all attached to the tubular space frame. It's not attached to the transaxle. So the engine and the transaxle in this car are really only partially stressed. They're not stressed in the classic way you'd see with an Indy car or Formula One car or a lot of more modern cars. And the reason they did that is because basically it's going to weigh just a tiny bit more but you're not gonna be stressing stuff out because this was built for track days. And, and the really neat thing about this particular Riley, they only made about six of them. Since they didn't have to do it to the Daytona prototype rules, they were able to make some things stronger. They were able to make some things lighter where it's better if it's lighter without the rules. So they made some things heavier for longevity. So basically you get a car with more downforce that lasts longer, it's easier to service, but weighs about the same. And with more horsepower, it ends up being faster than a normal racing Daytona prototype, which is really cool. You out, Blaine? See you tomorrow, dude. So that's really neat. And then if you look at the space frame here, guys, so you can see two bars coming from up there at the top of the roll cage and down to this node here. You see some square tubing here, which is rather big, about say inch and a half by two inches uh, square coming from there. It's your vertical part coming to that same node. Then you got your bottom ones, it's triangulated. And the suspension, very normal for racing. I mean, not much different than has existed from long, long times before. Here you see your upper link of the suspension going from the chassis to the upright. And Aaron, I'm going to take this camera for a second. So if you guys look at that, that is a billet aluminum upright. I mean, that is just beautifully machined. That's not cast. That's gorgeous. So you can see right here, that's your top of your suspension mount, that rod. And then you got a trailing link at the top that goes way over there to the frame. You got your trailing link down there at the bottom. I think you guys can see that. It goes there. And then down at the bottom, you've got one uh, transverse link there and another one in the back. There's your shock. There's your brake cooling duct that you guys remember. That's that black thing with the little strings around it. And then there's the, the hole where the air goes in. And then this guy here that's blue and orange, or excuse me, blue and yellow, that is your pneumatic ram for your air jacks. Let's go ahead and take that back, Aaron. The other things I'll show you guys, so this right here, I got my hand on, I'm leaning on, this is the sway bar. And what makes that adjustable is this fin right here. So if you kind of pan back a little bit, Aaron, so you can see this whole thing. So if you see this fin guys here, when I adjusted those sway bars to change the balance in the cockpit, I was adjusting this push-pull cable. It looks like it's a little loose actually, that's gonna need to be tightened up. But when you turn this, you see how that, that sway fin can turn? Now I can't turn all the way because it's mechanically locked, but if that fin is dead upright, it's not gonna bend much, right? And you're gonna, it's gonna be all the twisting of this, 
this uh, rod here. But when it's like this, it's softer and that fin can bend this way. That makes your anti-roll bar here, your sway bar, effectively softer. So that's, that's how you adjust them in race cars. And you can configure these in a multitude of ways. For instance, on the Indy car, there's two sway fins, but they're real close together. Okay guys, so coming back, right back to it. Aaron, I think you'll be able to see maybe best here. So here's one of the radiators. I mentioned you guys, they are on the side right back here. Now there's a lot going on with these there. And if I'm seeing these correctly, let me look here. We've got a number of them going on. So the one back here, this one, this appears to be kind of beat up actually. Wow, those fins are kind of jacked up. I don't know why. Maybe somebody was bumping into them or something. But the one right here where the, the, this is on is actually presumably oil. You can see an oil line here. And it's actually got a heat exchanger down there. So the water, I'll try to show you guys this. So the, the radiator here where the fan is, this first thickness right here, this, this area here, this, this looks to be oil. You can see oil line going to it, another oil line over here. Now those oil lines also go to that silver canister down here. Here's an oil line, here's the other one. And that silver canister, you can see that's a water a coolant line going to it. So that's a heat exchanger. And what that does is when you start up your car and it's cold and it's warming up, your water is going to heat up first because that's what cools the engine. But your oil takes a while to warm up. But if you run your oil through a heat exchanger, you can use the, t the heat energy in the water to heat up your oil and bring it up to temperature quicker than it would otherwise, which is a good thing. And also with a heat exchanger, for instance, our yellow Corvette over there with Genius Scratch, it only runs a heat exchanger for the oil because typically your oil temperatures will end up higher than your water temperatures. Um, and the heat exchanger will allow the heat energy in the oil to transmit to the water, which is a lower temperature, as long as your radiators for the water can handle that additional cooling necessary with the transfer of the heat energy from the oil through the oil water heat exchanger. I hope that made sense to all of you. And then right here, this is gonna be your water radiator. You can see this tiny little line here is just for air to bleed the air out of the system, which then will come all the way over here to this is your tank for your radiator for your radiators and your cooling, it's at the top. It's got a normal radiator type cap on right here, which will release pressure at 31 to 33 pounds. So it's pretty high, but that's a normal radiator cap, guys. But that's where you put it on something like this. And then here's your bleeders for your water. This is an overflow. It should go to a catch bottle somewhere back there. I haven't looked at it yet. Um, also, you'll notice this tube here and this tube here are for the fuel systems. So typically when you're filling this up quick, if it, this one doesn't have a dry brake on it right now for high speed racing, it's just got two aircraft caps on it. So we're gonna fill this up for track day or vintage racing or something where you don't need a pit stop. You'll take them both out. You will fill the fuel, and I think you can see my fingers in here because this is clear. You fill the fuel in the bottom one, and as the air rushes out, the air will rush out the top. And then you just pay attention so you don't overfill it and have it come spooshing out like that. So these guys just go back in there like that. With this, you turn it, and then you click it, and it locks down, and that locks down. And this little O-ring is what seals the fuel when you're using this kind of thing. Typical for the aircraft world. So this, if I'm not mistaken, is actually for power steering. It does have a power steering pump on it, I think. Unless I'm crazy. I don't know what else that could possibly be, if, unless I am wrong. Um, and you can see a little bit. So here's the Mighty V10 it's in this engine. But fortunately, you guys, I have another one right over here, which will be a lot easier to see. So last thing I want to show you on here is, you can see the header's gotten a lot of heat, so the ceramic coating that was on it has actually peeled off. I'm not entirely sure if that's all ceramic or whatnot, but it kind of bends, sort of interesting. And this one's got mufflers on it because it was at a, uh, you know, an automotive country club type place where they have sound decibel levels. Uh, when we go racing, we generally don't have sound decibel levels uh, or the places we go, so we're going to take the mufflers off. Listen to our Mighty V10, which at the current time being needs some love and is not running. But uh, you got your transaxle here, the, all the four gears, it's a six speed and they are behind the differential. And then you've got your bell housing here and your clutch is down in there, as is your slave cylinder for your clutch to, to push that. And then of course the engine is here. So Aaron, if you want to come around over to this side, we'll go ahead and open this up and show you guys the other motor, which also is a little, little sad, needs to be rebuilt. But this is the secondary motor, identical to the one in there. It's the BMW V10 out of the M6s. But of course, these are very much race built. They are, uh, uh, I believe this one, all I got to find out and verify. It's supposed to be bored and stroked a little bit. So it's got a crazy billet crank and amazing connecting rods and pistons. And it's got billet camshafts and it got rid of the varial cam thing. Oh boy, where am I going with this? I need to think ahead. Duh. Okay, here we go. Oh, but, okay, 
<laughs> How many dirt moments do you guys have during the course of the day? I mean solid dirt moments. I'm having a few. Oh God. Hey, okay. This, this is my, okay, it's there. Come on over camera person, help me. Get away from my derma. Check this out, yes! Okay, so a couple of things. Let's look at it first, because I know you guys are gonna be all excited. Look at these individual throttle bodies of glory. Yes, they're plugged up with this, because you don't want stuff falling down in there. But Aaron, if you want to take a peek, there's one of the butterflies. And yeah, there's 10 of these things. It's not hooked up right now. You can see this beautiful aluminum, billet aluminum guy here, and these uh, are linkages, so you can balance it properly mechanically. But you can see here, this is what operates the throttle bodies right here, the individual throttle bodies. And of course your fuel injectors are all right here. So my goodness gracious, those fuel injectors, if I look down in there, they're only about an inch, inch and a half away from being right at where the top of the valves are. So it's like right there, it's all very tight. And uh, I'm guessing that on this car, which I can't see because there's an air box, there are probably some velocity stacks on these with a little mouth bell, kind of like a, you'd see on a trumpet or musical instrument. The wiring harness per the motor, all gorgeous mil spec stuff. You'd find a military aircraft, all these solid pins. Just this connector alone, to be honest, is rather expensive to acquire. Of course, when you've got it used, it's only good for this sort of thing. So it's not like you can go take that connector and use it in your street car. It's all set up for it. But again, billet camshafts, the variable cam thing is gone. So that's all been built. You can see the coil packs right here. Um, it takes the low voltage of each spark and it has the actual coil to create the high voltage um, at the spark plug. Uh, appears to be a 90 degree um, in terms of the banks uh, for the V10, but just really cool to see. Uh, if you guys want, uh, after this, go search Dynan uh, V10 Dyno, and you can actually see, I don't know if it's that one or this one, but th these actual motors, I'm not talking what like it, it's, it's one of these two motors being dynoed by Dynan back in the day which is really neat. They're putting out something like 735 horsepower naturally aspirated. I guess the last thing, if you want to look at right here, you look down in here, you can see still retains the serpentine ribbed belt here, which is really nice for the alternator, uh, the water pump, which is up here. And then uh, whatever the heck that is. And then uh, this is some sort of harmonic dampener you can see here. And then of course the all important uh, toothed Gilmer type drive for the dry sump oil pump, which is over here. And then lastly, the other neat thing to see right here is here's the second transax also used, could stand to be freshened, but differentials in here, all this big, beautiful billet aluminum. The uh, shifting actuation for the pneumatic shifter of the sequential is right here. So presumably uh, if you wanna upshift, bam, this, these come off and this is where you attach it, right? So you got two high pressure lines going to it. So this gets a high pressure jet right here. It bangs it this way, up shifts. You get a high pressure jet in here. It bangs it that way and down shifts. So that's, that's how that works. I do believe I'm getting that information on the fact that there's only two things going to it's pneumatic and there's a D and a U. So if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but that seems to be the way. Then you got your connectors for things like vents and oil in and oil out to cool it. Uh, you got a little mount here and I believe that's where the tank is. So there's a pneumatic tank and then also on this car is an electric compressor that runs to keep high pressure in the little tank. So you've got your, your air pressure to actually do the shift uh, actuation when the solenoids hit. Not really a whole lot different from any of you hot rodder guys or custom car builders if you've ever airbagged a car. Uh, the stuff on this to make it shift is frankly a little more sophisticated than that stuff, but it basically works the same way. So. That's, that's what's going on, you guys, but I really wanna just do a walk over it. I think this is the most amazing donation I could imagine for Genius Garage. Um, and for all of those of you watching who haven't seen Genius Garage, the 501c3 educational, a nonprofit that exists for college age students that want to become into motorsports technicians, or frankly, just something awesome that helps launch their career in the engineering world. And that's why a lot of the past students are working at places like Tesla headquarters, or one just went to Lucid, we got them at GM, Fiat Chrysler, Dana, Honda, you name it and even guys that are wrenching on nothing but exotic cars and doing track days and racing stuff. So it's really cool. And there's a person who really believed in it, um, the program and the future. And this prototype needs a little love, we've got to rebuild it, but that's a great opportunity. And this is something that can exist for many, many years to come with Genius Garage and help give young people an opportunity they never would have had 
but when they do have that opportunity to get hands-on, which is so difficult in academia, that's what ends up getting them their jobs or putting them over the top in conjunction with their academic background. So really excited. Uh, I don't have plans for this just yet because to be perfectly honest, Genius Garage doesn't have the budget necessary to fix it up. So we got to plan that. And the Daytona prototype will probably be with the next crop of students as a great centerpiece. Right now, to end the video on, if you want to look over here, Aaron, turn right around. This is our 1989 IMSA Riggins chassis GTO Corvette. The only thing from a Corvette are the taillights, but we're getting it ready to race at the Mid-Ohio Vintage Grand Prix next weekend. Uh, and Dylan's just cleaning up, actually doing a little polishing all, after all the mechanical prep and stuff work is done. So this car has been around for a bunch of years. It's gotten a lot of young people jobs. There's been a lot of amazing memories. And I think we're gonna make some mem I'm so excited. <laughs> We're gonna make some amazing memories with this Riley prototype, and I think it's gonna launch a lot of careers too. So I hope you guys subscribe and stick around. Obviously this is my channel, but I love showcasing Genius Garage and sharing it there. If you wanna make a donation, you can go down into the description below and there's a link to the Genius Garage website, and that goes directly to Genius Garage, which of course is 501c3, and any contribution, whether it's monetary services or parts, et cetera, is of course tax deductible, which is a nice thing because it allows people to do nice things in the world <laughs> where otherwise you might not get to. So on that note, I'll see you guys next time. Car racing is the most affordable form of motorsports there is, and it's also the most competitive. So for that reason, you've got to have an amazing chassis. And for me, it's Top Kart. When I'm at a race, I simply go to topkartusa.com, check out their chassis setup and tuning guide, and that's the secret that gets me on the podium. So when it's time for you to go racing, Call up Top Cart USA. Shout out to KW Suspension. Guys, this year you're gonna see beautiful coilovers such as this going on many of my cars, including my Porsche 944, my Dodge Viper, and even some of these crazy race cars. And the reason is simple. This is one of the best shock companies in the world. It was founded in Germany in 1992 by Klaus Wolfarth, and recently they just launched a new 1.2 million square foot robotic warehouse where they're creating unbelievably nice suspension components such as this for 15 different original equipment manufacturers. So whether you're a street enthusiast, a weekend track warrior, or you are building the Le Mans car your dreams, guys, check out KW Suspension. Unbelievably nice shock. So go down in the description below, patronize them. You're gonna be glad you did.